Welcome. I'm Dr. Kristen Ekstrand, a fourth-year medical student at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center and co-director of the Vanderbilt Program for LGBTI Health. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ed Callahan, Associate Dean for Academic Personnel and Professor of Family Medicine at University of California Davis School of Medicine, and Dr. Carl Street, Jr., Internal Medicine House Staff at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. Thank you guys both for being here. Ed, why is it important for students, residents, and, and faculty to become involved in LGBT health education and advocacy at their home institutions or, or beyond? Uh, I, think it's, I think that's something that's really critical, Kristen. The, the reality is our whole culture has had a, a policy of don't ask and don't tell. There's always been silence around LGBT issues. Since people have always felt that there was something wrong around lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, it, it, it's been a shaming process that has suppressed any activity about LGBT health. So we've got a tremendous amount of work to do in terms of making medicine a safe place for patients and for learners. I would have to echo what Ed has to say. And also the point is that LGBTI individuals face significant health disparities, always have, for the most part, worse health outcomes within our, within our system. Focusing on that from a medical school or from specifically from an education perspective and then moving on to like national advocacy tries to narrow the gap in these health disparities. Um, to do otherwise, I think, is missing out on a large uh, part of what it means to be a physician. So when we talk about so some of these opportunities um, you know, for involvement at schools or in advocacy work outside, what, what opportunities exist for students, residents, and, and faculty members in doing this type of work? So I think there's a tremendous number of opportunities that exist. And I wouldn't start with medical students. I would start with undergraduate students mm -hmm. that are interested in a career in health, because I think we need people to learn how to find a voice for themselves and for uh, taking care of other people who have health issues. So if you start with medical students and you go, uh, start with undergraduate students and you go progressively through, then there are hundreds of projects that need to take place to make our institutions safe and comfortable for our patients, for our uh, students, for ourselves. So that, again, that has all the right answers, I would say. Um, the opportunities are, are fairly boundless in terms of where you want to start. Um, I think it's always easier to start at your own institution. It's what you're familiar with. Um, and you can start going down the line looking at policies, looking at any kind of complaints by patients or students or, or positive uh, events and celebrating those. Um, it's important to then start thinking more broadly, like you've kind of gotten used to what it's like at your institution, you've done some wonderful projects, but you need to start sharing that with others, making sure others are actually able to replicate these kind of efforts at, at other schools, because we don't have standards across all the schools, across all education bodies, so we need to actually share amongst each other. Um, beyond that, nationally, a lot of organizations, a lot of student organizations, a lot of professional organizations that are working on this that are eager to have students jump in. Um, so again, many opportunities. So it sounds like with the way that, that you guys are talking about it is really in the context of you know, institutional uh, opportunities. And this can be anything that, that may relate to climate or to researching a specific health outcome. Um, but then even local opportunities, engaging with local uh, community organizations yeah. to try and you know, increase uh, patient uh, interaction with the institutional healthcare mm -hmm. setting or even a quality improvement type work and then these national organizations. Can you name a couple of the national organizations that people often get involved in when doing health advocacy for LGBT populations? Uh, in terms, from my experience, the American Medical Student Association has been great. They have a gender and sexuality committee that's been around for decades uh, that works on LGBTI issues. Uh, the American Medical Association has been working very diligently from a national policy level on LGBT issues. And of course, uh, GLAMA, uh, Health Professionals Advancing LGBT Equality, have been working on this since the 19, uh, 1970s, 1980s. So those are some of the big ones that are out there. But of course, like the, uh, the Student National Medical Association has been addressing LGBT issues from an intersectionality perspective in terms of race and ethnicity as well. So I would agree with all of those. Who are, those have been very important institutions. 
One of the things that's happening in medicine is that we're really recognizing that we don't provide care just from, medis from the medical side alone, that we need to be involved as team members with nurses, nurse practitioners, psychologists, social workers, mm -hmm. mental health people. So each of those groups has, uh, has groups that are advocating for changes around LGBT health issues. So we need to be allied with the people who are learning how to do that in those institutions. We need to be also building the infrastructure for having more involvement in LGBT health. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has happened over the past couple of years is that there's been a new group that has formed that's putting on the LGBT Healthcare Workforce Conference, recognizing that medicine and other areas don't have the an adequate group of providing LGBT health care. This group has come together and is having a yearly conference where people come together, share ideas, develop projects, and talk about the research they're doing. Mm -hmm. We need to be seeding more of that nationally, and especially things that start to look at intersectionality more, where we really start to appreciate diversity involves not just race and ethnicity, but sexual orientation, gender identity, ability, disability, uh, spiritual beliefs, and other things. The more we can recognize that we have allies in this diverse community, the more we're likely to be effective in bringing about true changes mm -hmm. that help to reduce health disparities. And in terms of uh, residency advocacy, uh, I, I hear medical student organizations being mentioned and then these broader organizations that discuss uh, LGBT health, whether it's from um, an LGBT specific standpoint or as something part of a, a profession specific organization. What opportunities out there are there are there for residents? So there, there are opportunities out there for residents. They're very hard to remain uh, involved uh, just because of the demands on a resident. First and foremost is patient care and your own education, so trying to work with any organization is always a matter of where do you fit it in your schedule. Um, again, all the organizations I've listed are very welcoming of residents continuing to do work on this, um, but resident-specific organizations, I, I actually don't think we have enough doing that. We have the, some resident organizations look from a union perspective trying to organize the resident labor force and providing, um, ensuring that there's uh, non-discrimination policies. But beyond that, I don't think we have enough resident-specific organizations that address this. I would also argue that it's important to have resident groups come together within institutions. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge is that there are so many different residencies, and they don't, yeah. they don't coordinate very much from one residency to another. But all of them share the challenge of trying to provide better care for LGBTIQ patients. Mm -hmm. So that's an area where residents can come together at each institution, talk about what they need to learn in order to be able to provide competent care, effective care for LGBT people, and they can start to do building that can then get shared. One of the nice things about this era is that Anything, any good idea that you come up with can be built upon and shared nationally mm -hmm. in seconds. I, I do want to add, though, in, in addition to everybody focusing on trying to do the best for their patient, they're also trying to, like we talked about with the workforce conference, trying to improve their own um, diversity within their, within their programs. So these residents often pool their resources to try and improve recruitment to their own programs, saying we're going to look at diversity from a very broad perspective, as, as the AAMC has also redefined, um, and have essentially effectively increased the number of out providers. And the more out providers we have, the more comfortable out patients can be as well. And that's a parallel effort, right, with the, uh, all the efforts to try to diversify residencies. Mm -hmm. Residencies have traditionally admitted people into their program on the basis of scores. Scores correlate with how much privilege you've experienced up to that point in mm -hmm. your life, and therefore we tend to have an, an overly white, an overly male uh, group of residents, and that means that our subspecialties don't have the diversity that they need to provide care for the diverse population that we have. So LGBT people can be an important part of increasing that diversity as well. Absolutely. 
So if we if we focus in a little bit more on the the institutional aspects that we've been talking about, um, can you can you provide an example um, of a you know an institutional uh, sort of health advocacy uh, initiative that has been spearheaded by um, a student or a resident or a faculty member? So one of the things that we've had uh, is that a woman who just graduated and started medical school herself started an an internship program for undergraduates from the main campus. She linked them up with people that needed help in putting together some of the initiatives that we have going on. So we had a trans committee meeting for the past year. She was able to identify trans students and trans allies from the undergraduate campus that wanted to participate and help other people. She identified somebody from that group that wanted to take on and run the internship program for the next couple of years. So you have this incredible pool of talent that wants to have a role in increasing the quality of the atmosphere for everyone around LGBT health that want to come over to the campus, that can be tapped into, that, that uh, can find their voice and grow in that position. It, and it sounds like one of the amazing things about that student's work is the uh, ability to essentially find sustainability mm -hmm. for the program afterwards by identifying the next leader, which is, which is excellent. Um, and just to hone in a little bit more on that example, what, what barriers did you face in getting that up and running, and, and how did you overcome those? Well, we have a barrier called the causeway that lies between the medical campus <laughs> and the main campus which is about 15 miles. So, I mean, if that, it's very little in terms of distance, but it's a psychological barrier that keeps people from working across the two campuses. Mm -hmm. So she, it's really been important in bringing undergraduates over that 15 mile stretch, getting them involved with people, having a, them have a chance to see themselves being part of medicine, being part of healthcare, and uh, getting inspired to do it. Carl, can you think of an example uh, of sort of student resident or faculty-led advocacy at an institution? So some advocacy that I see in a lot of different medical schools and public health schools and a variety of health profession schools is the idea of trying to increase visibility within the faculty and the student body to essentially say we are a welcoming environment that we will foster your interest in LGBT issues. Um, one that we always see uh, popping up very simply, and not always, but it, it's, it can be a, a simpler project than others, is creating an outlist, essentially collecting all the information of those who are willing to be out at their institution and publicizing that. That sends a very strong message saying these people feel out and proud at work, that they feel safe, um, and that they are encouraging oftentimes uh, people to come to them and ask for questions to get guidance on what they can do at their own institution. Um, a lot of schools are doing this now, which is great, um, and a lot of prospective students, prospective faculty and employees then go to these sites and say, this is a great place for me. Um, and as a result, the community grows and gets stronger. And that, that's like the exact opposite of that don't ask, don't tell uh, climate that, that you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. Ed. And in, in talking about barriers, again, Carl and Ed, what do you think are some of the barriers that have really come up in terms of um, advocacy building at institutions? So I think there's a long history of unconscious bias against mm -hmm. anyone who's been different, whether you're different by the shade of your skin, whether you're different by your beliefs, whether you're different by your sexual orientation or gender identity. People who were different were treated and marginalized systemat systematically makes it sound conscious, and sometimes it was conscious. But we have a long history of unconscious bias making it more difficult for LGBT people, more difficult for uh, people of color, more difficult for women mm -hmm. to be able to have a voice and to be able to deal with things. So, and that gets in the way of advancement, leadership, et cetera. So we've got a lot of catching up that we're doing as a culture. Yeah, some of the barriers that I've seen at when it's not overt and very explicit saying we're absolutely not going to fund you to do anything LGBT related, um, you can run across apathy or significant inertia within an institution to actually create change. Um, oftentimes they love student ideas, but then if they really don't want to support it, they're like, okay, you students go do that, but then you're busy getting your work done and then you're going to graduate 
and oftentimes it's not sustainable. So that's one of the larger barriers is actually creating sustainable projects that are then fully endorsed by the institution. Um, in terms of the idea of inertia, sometimes you'll be at an institution that says, oh, we totally support LGBT, but everybody who comes there feels isolated and alone, and they don't realize that it's a welcoming place. So the invisibility of, of that welcoming environment uh, has been a barrier to actually highlight what you guys are actually supporting. In academia, we've had a long history of using our scholarship to bring out the important ideas mm -hmm. and to advance the thinking. I remember the first time I put a research proposal into our IRB, mm -hmm. I was not allowed to do the study because I asked students to identify what their sexual orientation and gender identity was on an anonymous questionnaire. But I was asking the question, and the IRB felt it was just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. That kind of suppression of scholarship kept us from looking, it made some areas too sensitive to, to address. Mm -hmm. And by being too sensitive to address, you miss the voices. So for example, in the past, AAMC never had sexual orientation and gender identity as identifiers on student surveys. So for graduation surveys, we really didn't know what the experience was for LGBT people. And it's important that we know that. It's important that we understand that if we're going to make it a safe environment for LGBTI students. And has that changed, that aspect of data collection? It has changed as of this year, actually in the past year, so that uh, in the second year survey, the post-matriculation survey, it's now asked as a standard question for all of the students taking that. Mm -hmm. So that's a very uh, excellent method, I think, of being able uh, to in an anonymous way sort of strategically figure out the experience of, of LGBT students. Um, and that was led by the AAMC and the faculty that are an administration that are part of it. Uh, what are some of these other strategic approaches that can be used maybe earlier on in your training, whether you're a student or, or a resident, to overcome some of these barriers? Hmm. So <laughs> no, it's it's there, there are a lot of different approaches, and it's very case-specific, in my opinion. Um, if you're at an institution that, again, is welcoming but not well-known, you kind of ha you have to identify somebody who's willing to be a very vocal advocate, um, who will then essentially draw resources towards them and other people and create a network. Um, and again, you kind of need somebody to be a squeaky wheel at those less than welcoming environments to really advocate for some sort of change, something positive. Um, specifically, you need to really work on recruitment and retention of your students and your faculty and staff. Uh, you really need to provide concrete examples of how the curriculum can change. You have to know your own curriculum inside and out and then provide uh, essentially the LGBT information to fill in because oftentimes the faculty don't, they, are, they will say we don't feel comfortable enough to say we're expert on that. So then the students have to become experts and provide that information. Those are some of the more common strategies. Uh, so where we started was with basically trying to keep uh, trying to increase the social comfort of the people, LGBT people, on the faculty, among the students, mm -hmm. uh, among the residents. We started with those social happenings in people's homes and expanded the number of people. It started initially with just faculty, then with faculty and students and residents, and staff are a part of this now as well. For us, we also felt that if we were going to decrease the amount of health disparities for LGBTI people, we needed to know who they were. By being invisible as part of our health system, they were not identified to get increased quality of care. So we started a project to uh, incorporate sexual orientation and gender identity into the health system, mm -hmm. in, into the health system electronic uh, medical record. That was very important. It brought people together that were very committed to that. And then as we were doing that work, it became clear that people didn't know enough about what these health disparities were. Mm -hmm. So we ended up doing a side project where we looked at the entire curriculum for the medical students, identified the competencies that you would need in order to be a good practicing physician taking care of LGBTIQ people when you graduated, 
and we systematically looked at every piece of the uh, curriculum and what changes needed to take place. So our first year students now, instead of looking at it from that sense, are studying all of their classes and taking notes on every time they are recognizing a lecturer could be talking about an LGBTIQ example in order to help people understand better. All of the curricula nationally are so impacted, they, they don't have time for adding large lectures, but everybody can add an anecdote or a little example mm -hmm. here and there in the process, and the students can start to say, where, what opportunities are there that are being missed, and we can do some very low-cost improvements in curriculum mm -hmm. that way. It's, it's important to present those reforms in the curriculum as not a zero-sum game. Like, we're not asking you to drop an entire lecture on COPD. We're asking for drop-ins where it's appropriate. Or we may want to talk about COPD and how LGBTIQ people are Smoke at greater tobacco. risk there. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that I'm hearing is that uh, what both of you have said is that, um, one, if you perceive yourself as, as being a, a leader or a champion of these issues, building your team and finding your allies uh, such that you can create a, a large enough voice to be heard is important. Mm -hmm. And whether that is um, an administrator who has built that voice mm -hmm. and has a lot of influence, or if you're a group of medical students who may need to document all the different instances in which they perceive LGBT health as being re relevant. Um, having that team is really important. So finding that champion and building your team. And then mm -hmm. what you both have mentioned in a, in a certain way is paying attention to the climate and figuring out where that, that need is and really directing your projects towards those things that you know your team has an ability to influence. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's important to recognize what's the context of the reform you're hoping to achieve. It's wonder, I would love for every, every university, every education body to have an LGBT curriculum, like a very serious, robust one. But some people will get there in two years, others will get there in 10 years. And if you try and get there too quickly, you're going to run up against more barriers, I think. So it's important to really work within the context you have right now. And the, the patience, I guess, that comes along with all of that and in, in terms of maintaining the speed of a project and yep. being okay with the speed of where it's going. Recognizing that moving mountains takes time. Yeah. 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 But, we're, but we are moving, we're moving them, them. A, little, a little bit at a time. Yeah. The other piece, though, is that I think it's a mistake to think just LGBT people doing the work because that would never work. Yeah. What, you, you have this incredible community of people that value diversity where LGBT is one aspect of diversity, these allies are, it's the alliances that mm -hmm. do the work. I mean, we had, when we put together our task force to put sexual orientation and gender identity into the, uh, into the electronic health record, the majority of the people there were heterosexual, cisgendered people, mm -hmm. but they were very committed to improving care for LGBTIQ people. Yes. And in listening to what you, you both have accomplished, it's, it seems like it's an incredible amount of work that you both have done. How has that changed uh, over the course of your career? Um, and, and how has it affected how you're treated at your institution and within your careers? So I'm still pretty much, I would say I'm pretty early in my career, just as a resident right now, trying to figure out exactly what my next steps are. Um, but it has definitely changed. I, I initially was not planning on being the LGBT advocate. I was really focused on um, being an infectious disease doctor and thinking more from the disease perspective and, and the communities around that. But I found more and more as I was going forward that I felt like we were missing too much on LGBT. And the more I kept working on that, the more that became what I, would, what, what I found enjoyment in doing as a career. Uh, so I would say this kind of work has redirected me to focus on that, and I'm very happy for that because it offers a lot of different opportunities, and LGBT issues can be uh, laid over many other issues. I think, I think Paul Farmer talks about it, the idea of focusing on uh, patients in poverty allows you to focus on any patient because so often what affects them affects everyone else, and I would say the same for LGBT individuals. Um, in terms of what my institution allows me to do, uh, Johns Hopkins Bayview, Johns Hopkins in general, has been very supportive. Uh, sometimes it requires a little bit of a nudge, but more than, often than not, they've been really welcoming to the ideas that I bring forward, that our, a group of us bring forward. It's never just one person. 
Um, moving beyond that, it's hard to say exactly what's going to happen. So often do we run against barriers that we're not aware of, that we will have um, covert uh, discrimination upon us uh, that we, we can't be aware of at every moment. Um, I would say for the time being, I have not felt that. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Um, I, I imagine, I, can't, I don't want to speak for you, but I imagine I'm experiencing far fewer barriers than you might have working on a similar topic when you were going through training. <laughs> It's a uh, night and day, probably, but the uh, I think I've had the advantage of seeing how academia has changed over the past 42 years, mm -hmm. where we are really uh, we're able to raise and talk about things now that we were not able to talk about in the early years of my career. When I uh, entered academia. I knew of no one who was out as a gay or lesbian person in academia. That's obviously changed substantially. I've, I've known friends for years that were fired for having been uh, discovered to be LGBT in the 1960s, 1970s. So the, the, that's part of our history. There are probably places now where it's not safe to be out also. But there are more places, increasingly there are places where people recognize it's critical that it, they create a safe environment for everyone mm -hmm. in the institution. So it's much improved in that sense. You were very flattering talking about some of the work I've done or some of the work that Carl's done. I haven't done anything alone. Mm -hmm. The only work that I've done has been the uh, result of a team of people coming together and working very hard and very selflessly. So groups can change institutions. I don't know that a single person does so much. I would have to strongly echo that. Be doing it on your own is a sure way to fail. Um, you have to draw in many people within the LGBT community as well as allies. Um, to do otherwise is sure a failure. Ed and Carl, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate all the insight uh, and, and thoughts that you provided. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure, Kristen. And thank you for the work that you do. Oh, Absolutely. Thanks.